Hello and welcome back to my channel. <clears throat> uh, I know it's been a minute since I've been here. Um, wanted to give you guys an update on what's been going on with me. In October, I was um, had my last chemo done for the year. Then I go back in six months and start all over again for the year of 2022. I'll get four more doses next year. Um, I um, end up getting uh, some autoimmune shots that's supposed to help uh, build my autoimmune system up because um, it had dropped down really low. My blood pressure and stuff had dropped really low. My iron had dropped. Um, my CDC number uh, was uh, not where they should have been and they was talking about giving me a blood transfusion because uh, my white cells had uh, started taking over my red cells and I am anemic but I've been like that all my life but uh, so far uh, I'm back on track but uh, when I got uh, after I took my last dose of chemo, I had to wait before I even started the autoimmune shots because he wanted to make sure the chemo was uh, in my system really good before you know they gave me the shots. Because chemo do break um, you know, my uh, autoimmune system down also. And by me having pneumonia back in June, that didn't help any either. So... He kept talking to me about it. So he finally convinced me to go ahead and get the shots because I don't like needles. And I told him the only way that I would take the shots, he would have to be the one that administered the shot to me. I did not want the one from the lab to do it. I didn't want the nurse to do it. I wanted him to do it. So he agreed and he did. He gave me my shots. So I actually didn't feel the needles at all, you know, because that was my biggest fear. Because a lot of times people give you shots, they just jab the needle in your arm. Don't have no compassion about you already in pain, you know, but they don't care. They're just doing a job and, and keep, it, keep it moving as I, I consider it. But he actually did it to the point I didn't even know the needle he had done. And I'm like, uh, I'm waiting. He's I'm done, you know. And I appreciate, you know, him not counting like one, two, three, and then stick, you know, because that's mostly what they, you know, the nurses and doctors will do. So, you know, like I told him, if you're going to do it, just do it. Don't, no counting. And they say, you know, he's, I'm done. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't even feel it. But I did feel it after I got home. I ran a fever from the first one he gave me. I ran a fever. Uh, for of 103 for three days and um, I didn't feel like I was sick but I was actually sick and then uh, after that I went back and he gave me the second one and that was the one before the day before Thanksgiving that I took it and I ran a fever of 102 and I only had a fever for like one day behind that one. But that first one threw me for a loop. I had a fever. I had a cold. I mean, I was sick. But the second one, you know, it, the only thing I did was ran a fever. And I was fine after that. And uh, that was in October. So in November... Well, actually, yeah, let me double check here because I, I wrote everything down. I'm having difficulty with my neck. I've been sitting here trying to get these videos done and um, finally got me so to calm down. Uh, so I took the, the, yeah, it was in November when I, uh, yeah, I had the shots done. It was in November. So, um, uh, 
I went to go see my um, rheumatologist, no, my pulmonologist last week. And um, he got the results back from him when I, he had me to go and have a CT scan done of my uh, chest and lungs. And um, we got that back and they showed that um, my right lung is completely gone now. Uh, I had only 5% of that lung anyway. And I have 85% of my left lung. And um, I'm doing good, you know. And he said, you know, eventually that I will have to go back on the oxygen because it's going to get to that point where I'm going to need it more because I only got, I'm only functioning off of one lung right now. But I'm blessed and thankful that you no, know, I'm, I'm, I'm having some good days and I'm having some bad days. But um, they're supposed to be starting me on a new medication that's supposed to slow down the process of the pulmonary fibrosis uh, that's attacking my lungs. And um, I have to do a liver test. So on the 17th, I go and have lab work done and um, get that done to have. Um, have them draw the labs for the, the liver test so they can get the results and stuff back to the doctor and um, so they can send it to my insurance company so my insurance company can go ahead and approve for me to get this uh, medication and then send in copies to the company that makes the medication. Uh, this medication is a specialty medication. It comes from a specialist pharmacy. You just can't write a prescription and go and pick it up. They have to deliver it directly to your house, and you have to sign for it. And um, it's supposed, like I said, he said it's supposed to slow down the process of the pulmonary fibrosis. And he like, as soon as possible, as soon as I can get this going, the better, greater chance I have to, you know, to slow the process down on my left lung. Although it doesn't cure the pulmonary fibrosis, but it slows it down. And then he said, it will give me more lifespans. So uh, that's where I'm at on that point, you know. And uh, on Tuesday, I went to go see my rheumatologist. And um, in November, I contact them and find out did they have uh, the results back for my... Um, on Disney and the CT scan um, and the x-rays and stuff off my neck and spine. They said no, they hadn't received anything. So I contacted the people where I had it done. They said they never got no referral or anything from them. And the lady was telling me that I can download the app and uh, register and I can get my, you know, I can have access to my report and everything. I'm like, okay. So I did that and I, um, went on uh, to my app that I have with my doctor, with the rheumatologist, where I sign in, check in. Before I get there, uh, I was able, they have an option where you can send a message to the doctor. So I sent him a copy of both of the reports. And then I get a re res response back saying that he reviewed it. So I asked him what we're going to do. He said he'll see me in December. This was the third week in November when this I sent that information to him. So I called the office and asked them why I have to wait until December to see the doctor. She said because uh, the doctor is um, going on vacation. He'll be back the, uh, the week that uh, you come in. I'm like, okay. So when I went in, we sat and I was in pain. <coughs> Excuse me. I was in a lot of pain. So my blood pressure was elevated. And um, his thing was to me, when I asked him about the results and everything, is pain management. And I'm looking at him like pain management. I'm sitting here in a lot of excruciating pain when I'm telling you that it feel like something crawling up and down my spine right now. My neck is so stiff, I can barely turn. I had to turn my whole body sideways to sit in the chair so I could be able to look at you and you telling me pain management what pain management I'm not going to do anything when I went to pain 
Last time I was in Painesville was in 2017. And they took me off all my medication. All of it. All the pain pills that I was on. I was on three different types of pain pills that was working for me. And they took it off. They reason was they was worried about my liver. I hadn't had, had any problems with my liver because um, my internal medicine doctor was checking my liver all the time. Because he knew I was on this, all this medication. You know, and the rheumatologist that I had at the time knew I was on this medication. So, they decided to take me off of it. So, after they did all that, I ended up getting um, my uh, license so I could be able to get the CBD oil and stuff. And that stuff doesn't work for me. You know, it works for about an hour and it's gone and the pain is back. So I mentioned to him that I would like to see a surgeon and get the, the surgeon point of view on what I need to do about my neck and spine because I'm in a lot of pain. And I, you know, I'm, I don't, I can endure a lot of pain, but when the pain gets to the severe to the point where I start crying, tears coming out of my eyes and I'm in a fetal position, I'm hurting. I need help. I need you to help me right now. Not telling me that there's nothing you can do or that I need to go to pain management. There's nothing pain management can do for me. You know, when I get to that point. You know, so, um, what was it? Sunday, I was in so much pain, abdominal pain, to that I was balled up in the fetal position and I was crying. And my daughter walked in, she's like, come on, we're going to the urgent care. And uh, she got me up, got me dressed and helped me get dressed and took me over to the urgent care. And when I got over to the urgent care, um, they took me straight back and um, they uh, took my blood pressure. They like, oh, your blood pressure is out of the roof. And what we can understand why your blood pressure out of the roof is you you in a lot of pain. I'm like, yes, I am. And they uh, did a CT scan, x-rayed on my stomach. Because like I told it was in my abdominal stomach pain. You know, because I thought to take a lot of this had came back. Uh, but no, I had an ulcer flare up. So they gave me a cocktail shot. And um, they gave me uh, some liquid medicine to drink. And they told me to, uh, to get some um, nickel magnesia to drink and then contact my uh, primary care doctor. So uh, what I did, I, I had nickel magnesia at home already. So I came back home. I started taking that every six hours to help with my stomach. And I called my uh, internal medicine doctor on that Monday and, and they told them what was going on. And then they called me back and told me the doctor said, well, he'll see me on the 27th to just continue to take the medicine and he'll see me on, on the 27th. I'm like, okay. So that's, you know, where I'm at right now with that. Because like I said, you know, it's it's been a toll ever since June, having pneumonia, being on oxygen to I work myself off oxygen and I'm I'm very blessed and grateful and thankful that I'm here but it just to the point that now that I you know it hurts a lot more and I don't like to complain and I don't like to nobody you know feel like that you know you know I'm putting on an act it's not an act this is real for me you know i can sympathize with people that actually go through different types of illness i can understand their pain and i can understand and, and see people that actually fake like they in pain i have seen a lot of those those are the ones that really irritates me because when i was in pain management i used to see people come in there just to get the pain pill they back there oh screaming and hollering like they in so much pain as soon as they walk out that door, they, they walking and laughing and moving so fast.
or when you're in that doctor's office, you, you, you barely can move. Those are the people that I don't have no sympathy for because they are not in pain. They don't know what real pain is until it really hit them. You know, and I I go in, they like, how you doing? I'm, I'm hurting. You don't look like you're in pain. And then I'm like, I might not look like it. I said, but I am in pain. And my blood pressure can tell you I'm in pain. So when they take my blood pressure, they say, oh, your blood pressure is sky high. Yes. My blood pressure. I take my blood pressure every day, every morning. So I know when my blood pressure, what is a regular blood pressure for me and what is not a regular blood pressure for me. I mean, in October, my blood pressure had dropped really low. Today, we're talking about giving me a blood transfusion. I mean, and, you know, iron transfusion. I, mean, I do an iron transfusion, but a blood transfusion? No, I'm not doing that one. My blood pressure was running me from 108 to over 30, 118 over 68. That's what my blood pressure was running me in October. So I started drinking Wilson's grape juice. I started eating more beets, liver, you know, different types of vegetables that can help me build my iron level back up and my blood level back up. I did what I needed to do to get that back because, like I said, a blood transfusion wasn't an option at all for me. I was that I was not about to do, you know, it's a blood transfusion. But I did get my numbers back to where they needed to be. So I'm happy with that. But, you know, like I said, it was a struggle for me in October and November, you know, dealing with what I'm dealing with. I, you know, I try to keep a smile on my face all the time, you know, because I look at it like this. If I'm smiling, I'm not thinking about the pain that I'm in, you know, because that pain is so unbearable. I mean, really, that, you know, people always say, she always got, you always got a smile on your face. Like, I have to smile to keep from crying sometimes, you know, because that's how serious my pain is at times. I, I, I do what I have to do to get through what I'm going through. And it's a struggle. It's a big struggle, you know, to do these, you know, to do this. And I I just sit back and I think, and I thank God, you know, that I have came so far, you know, from where I used to be. And I know I still have a long ways to go. You know, it's, it's, it's a journey that I'm going through. You know, I wish I knew about YouTube when I first got diagnosed about this, you know, and I could, you know, document everything that, you know, I was going through. But, you know, everything happens for a reason. And I'm, you know, I'm documenting it now because, you know, I struggle so hard when I first got diagnosed. I did. I struggled really hard. I went through my why me stage and everything, you know, and I, you know, I had to think, you know, everything happened for a reason. I can't blame no one because I actually did it to myself. I overworked myself. When your body is sending you signs, you need to pay attention. Me, I did not. I work myself sick because I had two kids that was depending on me to take care of them you know and and I did the best I could to do that to the point that I worked myself sick till I wasn't able to work anymore you know um I was going to do a separate video about this, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you all about it now. Uh, in 2004, when they diagnosed me, my kids was in high school and just joined, just started middle school. And 
I end up losing my job. You know, we end up homeless. I end up making sure my kids had somewhere to live, you know, until I was able to, you know, get us back together as a family. You know, we were split up for five months. I went through so much with the Social Security board trying to get my disability and Social Security. I even tried to get uh, my uh, unemployment. I couldn't get that because I had applied for disability and Social Security. And so when you apply for that, you cannot get get those. You know, did nobody tell me that? You know, they you know they all tell me go go and apply. You know, for your Social Security disability. And then go then. One of my bitches said, well, you try to get your unemployment. I tried that, couldn't get my unemployment because of I had applied for disability and Social Security. So I wasn't eligible to get that. And the lady there at the unemployment agency told me, she said, you're not going to get your, your unemployment, but they're gonna, the state going to take it and put it in public housing in Section 8. And I advise you to go apply for public housing. She said, because it's a waiting list for Section 8, but you can probably get public housing. So, I did that. I went and applied for um, public housing. I made sure my son was somewhere and he can get back and forth to school and stuff. I ended up taking my daughter to, to Virginia to live with my sister. And I slept in my car. Um, on the church parking lot. And I did that for five months until I got the letter stating that I had got approved for Section 8, uh, for public housing. And in public housing, they give you a list of apartments that you can go and look at and you choose for which one you want. And none of them was in a good area. Not None of them was in a good area at all. I end up in my getting a place off of 45th and Moncree. Right down the street from Hilltop Apartments where they do the gun shooting all night long, all day long. That's where me and my kids end up living for a year until I got approved for Section 8 because after I did, I got applied for public housing that I got approved for, but I still want to apply for Section 8 because Section 8 gives you the option to where you can find your own place or where you want to live. So I did that. When I got the letter for that, got approved of it, They, um, I had to get okay from where I was living at to be able to move. And the lady told me no. The property manager <laughs> told me no. So I went back down to section, down to the public housing authority and talked to her supervisor and explained to her the situation I was in and what was going on with me. And my health wise, I took all my medical papers and everything. And the lady told me, she said, you can move. She contacted the lady over at the uh, department where we was at and told her that I'll be moving. She didn't like it, but it was better for me. You know, it was really hard because at you know in the middle of the day people shooting gun going out drive-bys my daughter was getting off the school bus and her gun shot and she dropped to the ground one of the neighbors told me your baby's down there on, on, at the bus stop on the ground won't move i had to go and get her you know that's what we endured after we end up being homeless and end up having to to live off of public assistance. You know. That's why I said I had I have I hit rock bottom. I had hit rock bottom. Went to the point where I ended up sleeping in my car. That was rock bottom for me. But I prayed and I asked God to help me and guide me to where I need to be. And bless me to be able to get public uh section eight. And I got section eight. And I was able to move into an, another area of town. 
that wasn't all that, you know, drugs and gun violence and stuff. And that's something I didn't want for my kids to grow up in, to be in. I'm a single mom with a, a son and a daughter living in an area like that. I didn't want to lose my son to, to that. I didn't want to lose my daughter to that. I didn't want to lose myself to that. So, yes, you know, I did what I had to do at that time. I lived there for a year. Not, you know, actually, I lived there 11 months because that year, like I said, they, the supervisor of the public housing told me I can go ahead and move. I didn't have to wait a whole year. So, after that, I, you know, we found us another place, you know, and it was, it was a nice apartment. You know, we was on the third floor, you know, no elevator, we had to walk up the stairs and stuff. And it was nice when we first moved there the first year. The first two years was really nice. And then after that, it started going downhill. Uh, when my son graduated and uh, he left to go in the Navy, it, st it really got bad. So we ended up having to downsize from a three-bedroom to a two-bedroom since he wasn't there anymore. So I uh, moved down to the first floor and... It got to the point where the people, they they sleep during the day and they stay up all night. And my apartment on the first floor was right by the staircase. So they was running up and down the staircase all night long. Sitting out there drinking and talking loud, throwing eggs and stuff all up against the windows and stuff. It was, you know, that apartment complex went downhill within two years. I'm like, okay. And it was just me and my daughter. Then my son was gone off to the Navy. So I prayed and I asked God to help me find something else. And by me being on public housing, you know, I still had, my lease wasn't even up yet. So I picked up the paper and I was looking at the paper and I seen this apartment in there. And it was in my price range of being able to pay rent for myself. I didn't have to worry about no public housing or section eight anymore so by then, by then i had started getting my disability and social security so i was able to get this place so me and my daughter went and met with the lady it was in a gated community and it was it was i say maybe uh two and a half miles from where the old the apartments that we was in at so we went we went up there and looked at those apartments. And um, and after that, the lady said that, you know, we can move in and everything. And um, we that's what I did. I moved there until, you know, my son, when he got out of the Navy. And then we ended up moving on, on the south side of town. So we was all together again when he came home from the Navy, but as I said, I went through a lot, you know, we endured a lot, and being separated from my kids for five months was really hard. I got to see my son every Sunday because I would be, we would be at church, and it would hurt me to be able to, you know, wasn't able to take him with me but I didn't have nowhere for me to go. So it was better for him to be with the family that I had, you know, had him with. It was one of the church member family. They had sons. And uh, so my son was able to stay with them. And they made sure he got to school and everything. And I really appreciated that, you know. And I was grateful for that. And like I said, um, I ended up taking my daughter all the way to Virginia to live with my sister and her family until I was able to do better. Although I can say my sister offered me to stay, like I told her, I had too much going on. I had applied for public housing. I applied for my disability and I needed to be here in Florida in case they needed to get in touch with me. Well, I needed to see them you know, right away. But she didn't know I was living in my car. My kids didn't know I was living in my car. Uh, to this day, 
my kids still don't know I was sleeping in the car. But I made sure they had a roof over their head and that they was able to get a meal. You know, um, I went to the shelter. They told me I couldn't stay at the shelter because I had a car. So I'm like, okay, I wasn't even able to get a meal or nothing like that. Uh, it was hard. It was really hard really hard you know I knew I had to take medicine I needed to be able to eat and some days I was able to eat some days I wasn't you know but that that was the life that I went through you know trying to make sure me and my kids get back together like I said when they approved me for the public housing I took it because I miss my kids my kids miss me and we wanted to be a family again so we have been through a lot together so when people say they have hit rock bottom I know because I did and I know how I felt and a lot of people ask me why you didn't contact your family I did I, I got in touch with my one family member that I know that would, wouldn't judge me, you know, wouldn't make me feel bad about the situation that I was in. That's that one person I did get in touch with, you know, because it was, it was really a low blow to me that I had to, you know, do that. And I'm not about to just go, you know, and let my family say, oh, I knew this was going to happen. No, listen, I didn't need that. I didn't need that negative vibe because I was already in enough negativity as it was. I needed uplifting. So for me, my uplifting was not to get in touch with nobody else in my family. You know, I have a lot of pride, you know, and that's why I'm, you know, I'm letting people know about this now, you know, because I want people to understand that a lot of people that you see out on the street, a lot of them is there because they have, they don't have a other choice to be there. And then there's a lot of them out there just out there to be out there, you know. I never thought that I would end up sleeping in my car. Never in my lifetime. Never thought I would ever lose my home. But it happened. And I look at it like it was a lesson. A lesson learned. That God needed me to, to go through. And it made me a better person. Today. You know, it made me much stronger. And I continue to make me stronger for what I'm going through. You know, and it makes my kids appreciate everything that they have and everything that they do a lot more. Because they know where we have been. And they don't none of us ever want to go that route again. We never want to be to that that position where we don't have a home. You know, a lot of people take that for granted. I don't take that for granted. My kids don't take that for granted. You know, we struggle. Yes, that we do. But we are proud people. We are proud of what we do. You know, we don't like being a burden to no one. You think I really want it to have to be a burden to my church member and my sister to put my kids there, but I had to swallow my pride and put my kids somewhere safe. I couldn't have them sleeping in the car with me. That I that wasn't an option. I look out for them first and I put them first. You know. So I just want all y'all to know that. Everything 
that I have been through, that was the lowest part of my life that I've been through since I've been sick, is being homeless. You know, I struggle and fight with doctors and stuff because I know what I need to do. And I know what doctors can do for you and I know what they won't do for you. You know, it's, it's, it's a struggle. It's always a struggle trying to get ahead. You know, I don't burden no one for nothing. I don't too much ask anyone for nothing. You know, I had um, a person that would always, you know, take me to my appointments and stuff. And I don't know, was it true or not that they said that I have so many appointments. I never seen nobody had so many appointments in, in, in a week. If you felt that I was being a bother, because at the time I didn't, at the time I had lost, I had to get rid of my car because I couldn't afford it anymore. So if you felt that I was being a bother to you, taking me to my appointments, I would have found another way, you know. And when they, you know, came back to me, I never asked the person. I just looked at it like this. That was a sign. Evelyn, you can do this by yourself. I contacted my insurance company and found out that I was eligible for transportation back and forth to my doctor's appointment, and I started using that. I stopped asking people to take me places to my doctor's appointments. I did because I felt that I was being a bother. And if, you know, I feel that I'm a bother to anybody, I, I don't bother that person. I walk away with my head held high and wish them the best. That's the way I look at it because I, you know, I'm, I'm struggling and I appreciate everything people do for me. I am very grateful and thankful for everything a person does for me. But make sure you're doing it from your heart. Not just because you feel like that you know, oh, I'm doing this here. No, make sure it's from the heart. Because everything that I do for a person is from my heart. It's not no that I feel that I have to. No, it's because I want to. No matter what I do for anyone, it's because I want to. I have learned that over the years. Like I constantly say again, I am very proud, a very proud person. And I will not ask no one to do something that they don't want to do. And you cannot do it, just be honest and say, no, I can't do that. Because if you ask me to do something and I don't feel comfortable, I'm going to tell you, no, I don't think I can do that. Or no, I'm not going to be able to do that. Because that's just the way I am. Like I said, I learned a lot being homeless by looking at other people, other homeless people. And I've talked to a lot of them. A lot of them was homeless because medical issues. Some of them was homeless because their spouse died and they have nothing else. Nowhere else to go, no family or nothing, or their family didn't want to be bothered. After their money ran out, the family was done with them. There is, like I said, I learned a lot from these people. I, you know, being humble. You know, it's, you can't never judge a book by its cover. Because you don't never know what that person going through or have been through. And like I said, you know, a lot of my family going to get to see this, this video. They going to get to see that I have been through a lot, of, a lot of struggle. Because like I said, only one of my family members knew what I was going through. 
and she's gone now. She's in heaven. So, I just like to say, thank you all for watching and sharing and my subscribers to all my videos. Namaste.